hit maker, I didn't really think of myself as a hit maker, but I think of my guitar as having the sound to give any track that I play on a better than even shot of being a hit. Of course, that's all just made up stuff, but that's how I think of it. was official end of 76 going into 77. We put out our first record in 1977. Every single song that we put out was a hit. And Grace Jones had become a fan of our second single. She decided that these two new guys would be the producers of what would have been her then next record. The only that we could really understand who she is as an artist is we have to see her live show. The records are one thing, but if we saw her live, we'd really be able to understand and we'd be able to write for her and write with her. So when Grace called us, she says, uh, what I want you to do is you go to the back door of Studio 54 and you tell them that you are personal friends of Miss Grace Jones. So we knocked on the back door of Studio 54 and the guy slammed the door in our faces and said, Oh, fuck off. We banged on the door. We get his attention again. He says, Didn't I tell you to fuck off? I had that light bulb moment. I just remember this guy going, oh, fuck off, oh, fuck off. So in my head, I'm repeating this in a loop, oh, fuck off, oh, fuck off. So we knew we weren't gonna get into Studio 54 that night, and we went to my apartment, and we picked up our instruments, because we were at my house, and we just started jamming, and I started playing, oh, fuck off, fuck Studio 54. We liked it so much once we started jamming, um, it was hooky to us, and we knew that uh, a bit before the hip-hop era, we certainly couldn't get fuck off on the radio. So with a little writing and rewriting, we wind up with, ah, freak out. To this day, it's the biggest selling record in the history of Atlantic Records. Okay, so the Freak is a really cool guitar part because it's very much in the tradition of what I do when I'm trying to make a guitar part special. So the basic part is... But what makes it Le Freak is by going. And playing those two things in sync by going. And believe it or not, Le Freak, say chic, didn't come in until the recording session. Luther Vandross came in and said, hey, that's a pretty big space. Why don't you try something? different there. And uh, Bernard went, uh, le freak, say chic. And we just stuck it in and it worked. So I found this guitar, the original hit maker, in 1973. It was not white. Since I was a Hendrix fanatic, I wanted it to be white. 
So I took it back to my shop and uh, stripped it and painted it white. Since we were a very new band, I wanted to do something that was a little bit more show businessy. So I put this reflective uh, pick guard on it because the lights, when they would shine the spots at us, I could actually take the guitar and shine it back at the people in the audience. And then um, I put these speed knobs on because there were quite a few songs in those days that uh, would have the, that kind of effect. And since we were a cover band mainly, we needed to be able to do that effect. I met Bowie at a after hours club called The Continental. We didn't talk about rock and roll and pop records at all. All we did was talk about jazz records. And he asked me, would I consider being the producer of his next record? And we went on this wonderful journey. It was probably the most exciting journey uh, of what I would call pre-production in my life. Put on your red shoes and dance the blue. David said to me, in no uncertain terms, um, that he wanted me to make a hit album. Let's be very clear. A hit album. Meaning he wanted every song to be popping like a Chic record or Sister Sledge. He invites me over to his house in Switzerland and I'm lying in bed one morning and he burst into my room and he says, Niall, darling, I think this is a hit. And he starts playing his folk song. And he was playing something that went like. And he played this for me and I just thought that he was actually trying to test me to see if I was a sycophant. I said, uh, hey, David, can I do an arrangement on that? And he said, yeah, I'd love to hear that. Uh, my first iteration of it was. But then I knew that he liked jazz, so right away I went to a minor 13 chord. And I said, that's cool. But for some reason, it sounded a little dark to me. Then I just decided, hey, what if I moved it up a half step? And that sounded really bright. And I was like digging that. Then I said, hell, let me move the whole thing up an octave. I also started to chuck. So I went. go into the studio and we count it off, within a few seconds that groove kicks in and I knew I had it. It doesn't quite sound like Let's Dance at the beginning because David is singing what he sang in my bedroom, but by the end now he's starting to get into the groove and he's starting to rewrite and change it. And finally he starts laughing and he goes, all right, all right. He's like convinced, I, I got it, it works, it's cool. David and I happened to walk into the control room when Bob Clear Mountain was setting up the various delays for the various things that he would throw to. And he had somehow rooted the guitar through one of those slapbacks. 
And at that time that he did that, there were other delays open. So what we wound up having was a multi-tap delay thing going on. <laughs> and David and I heard that and went, whoa, what the hell is that? So then I just played simply and then let the delays do all the work. And what was cool about it was by playing all upstrokes, it made the voice leading very strong. We both heard it and said to Bob, leave it like that. And Bob looks at us like we were crazy. And we're like, no, that's, that's happening. It's sort of doing what Nile does without Nile having to do it. People call me to collaborate, and the one thing that I feel really confident about is that I'm never without a musical idea. It, it could be anything. I always believe that I have a musical element to add to whatever I'm called for. So I met Daft Punk shortly after Bernard died and they came with their first album. We met at their listening party in New York and they pulled me aside and they said that they uh, quietly dedicate this album to Bernard Edwards. I didn't realize how much they loved Chic until I finally went and bought the album and <laughs> opened it up and I see a Chic record laying on the floor, uh, uh, you know, in the gatefold. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it now. Uh, the force from the beginning. Love. And they said, Niall, uh, we're in town. Uh, we'd like to come to your apartment and play some demos for you. They come to my apartment and they explain the concept of the album to me. They want to do a record as if the internet never existed. And I knew what that meant. They wanted to do this. <laughs> they wanted to do one of these records. And, uh, and I said, okay, cool. You don't have to play me any demos. And they said, well, well no, we want you to hear where we're coming from. And I said, no, I don't want to hear the demos. Uh, I make records on the spot. As a studio musician, I don't know what song I'm going to play before I get there, but when I get there, what I try and do is come up with the most clever part as quickly as possible because we started out like this and you had to do records fast. You had to come up with clever parts fast. They were meaningful. They had the groove with everybody. So I get to the studio, they play the first song and they played the song. I said, now turn everybody off except for the drummer and just let me play. I wrote out the chart and I played to the drummer and I said, that's the groove to me. The basic part is probably playing something like. And then probably the next one is probably playing something like. There's another one that's going. And that's actually where the chorus came from. That's where Get Lucky comes from. Because the song wasn't called Get Lucky when I played it. It was just whatever, track number five or something. We're up all night to get lucky. She's up all night to the sun. I'm up all night to get some. She's up all night for good fun. I'm up all night to get lucky. We're up all night to the sun. We're up all night to get some. We're up all night for good fun. We're up all night to get lucky. I grew up never ever thinking that my name would be on a model of a guitar and that my sound would represent a model of a guitar and that the way that I chose to set up and design it for my personal use, 
that it could mean something to someone else. Fender's become, in my mind, the great workhorse guitar. When I switched to Strat, my world changed. It was as if the guitar found me. It's really super versatile and they could do a classical session, a jazz session. It's just my baby. It just does whatever I need it to do. What's really interesting is that the hit maker is the only Strat that I've ever had that sounds like that. Everybody who's playing a Strat, their Strats have a certain vibe. My Strat plays, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. If you, if you can think that I would have bought more than 200 of these things in my life trying to find one. And finally, the only way I could find another one was Fender had to make it.